Okay, we begin. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks everybody for joining us. And today's speaker, we have Davo Jalto. He's a professor in religion, art and democracy at the University College Stockholm. Um, and today he's gonna to give us a presentation on the topic of orthodox theology and anarchism. So Davo, without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'll try to be uh, as brief as possible uh, and to talk uh, not more than half an hour or so, uh, since I do think that those discussions are normally much more interesting than talks themselves, so that we can afford more time to uh, go into depth and explore some of these issues that I'll outline uh, in the first part of, of today's uh, virtual meeting, uh, which will allow us also maybe to connect it to some of those uh, particular issues you individually might be uh, more interested in. So this talk uh, will be based on this book that I suppose uh, is the reason why I was invited to give this presentation in the first place. It's Anarchy and the Kingdom of God. And the subtitle is from Eschatology to Orthodox Political Theology and Back. Uh, let me first tell you a couple of things about the inspiration for writing this book and then present kind of an outline or the main argument uh, in the book. But the book basically uh, is inspired by the need to reassess, revisit the do dominant uh, political theologies in Orthodox Christianity. Um, first part of my presentation, just as first part of the book, uh, will be based on uh, uh, the exploration or rather a critique of the dominant traditional types of orthodox political theologies. And the second part is the presentation of my argument based mostly on uh, two theologians or religious thinkers, uh, Nikolai Berdyaev and partly uh, John Zizulas. Uh, but first, a couple of terminological clarifications, since the, uh, the main uh, topic is, is here for this talk, uh, anarchism and, and orthodoxy. So what is meant by anarchism? And since we will be using a lot the concept of political theology, uh, we should also say something about political theology, uh, how this concept uh, will be used in this talk and how it's used in the book. Uh, by anarchism, I, I use that term based, of course, on those historical uh, schools, let's say, of anarchism, schools in quotation marks, because they are not very systematic and they are very often not even schools in any kind of structured way. Uh, but not on any one of those individually taken, such as uh, anarcho-syndicalism or eco-anarchism or um, anarcho-communism or anarcho-individualism and so on. Uh, what, what, what I mean by that, based on some of the authors, is uh, a tendency, not fixed models, not fixed concepts, but rather a tendency that we can see across these most of those individual uh, movements that we can label anarchism, uh, a tendency that is critical uh, of every exercise of power and domination and oppression. And in that sense, anarchism really functions as, as a method, uh, as a method of uh, uh, critical assessment of society, and then trying to target uh, those power structures that are most oppressive in any period of time and uh, any given society and try to deconstruct that power. And uh, uh, by doing that, uh, spread uh, the horizon of freedom. Uh, that is a, an important kind of definition to keep in mind because that means that from my perspective, uh, when it comes to anarchism, just as a political philosophy and also uh, anarchism in the context of political theology, uh, it is not about proposing well-defined, well-shaped 
concepts about how to organize all societies on this planet. I think that um, it is a grave mistake and has been the mistake of political philosophies trying to come up with uh, one ideal uh, model of what society should look like and then abstractly apply it no matter what uh, different historical periods to different societies with very different uh, uh, sets of institutions, uh, beliefs, uh, living conditions, and so on and so forth. So that's why I insist on the anarchist approach as a kind of, let's put it that way, negative approach, which targets oppression and power structure in the name of freedom, uh, trying to make societies and interhuman relationships uh, freer, uh, but without codifying, without uh, uh, turning particular ideas or particular institutions into a kind of dogma that then needs to be uh, applied everywhere. Uh, which is, of course, that definition is different from some of those individual anarchist movements that actually tried not only to affirm freedom in individual societies, but also to propose a certain kind of social organization that would, in their view, uh, lead to uh, some kind of ideal or best uh, possible society. Uh, second important term here is political theology. And of course, that concept uh, can be understood in a variety of different ways. Uh, it is important to clarify that, and I do that at the beginning of the book, simply define, define political theology as a theological approach to the political. So reflecting on the political or sociopolitical realities from a theological perspective. Nothing more, nothing less. As you can see, this is not a, some kind of terribly sophisticated definition. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, useful and specific enough to differentiate it from how political theology is used, for instance, of course, in uh, the modern father, father of, the, of, the, of that uh, uh, term, uh, Carl Schmitt, where, of course, something else is meant by political theology. So in this sense, we are here, we will be dealing with concepts that uh, have to do with the history of political philosophy and pol political ideas uh, more generally, and also uh, theologies. They overlap to a significant extent, but there are also, of course, differences. And I think uh, toward the end of the talk, uh, differences between even anarchism as a political philosophy, as I just uh, described it, and anarchism as a political theology, I use it as a political theology in quotation marks just to make this tension and the difference between the two even, even more apparent, I think will be, will be much, much clearer. Okay, so uh, what is the problem with uh, predominant, with the character of the predominant uh, political theologies that we can find in Orthodox Christianity? Uh, as you probably all know or have heard, there is this concept that is constantly used when it comes to orthodox uh, political theologies, and it's used both in the public discourse and um, in scholarship, even some serious, serious scholarship, and it's uh, called uh, uh, the symphony or symphonia or Byzantine symphony or symphonia Byzantina. And that term is meant to be, or that, that's how it's normally used, to describe uh, ideal, the ideal kind of church-state relations from an Orthodox Christian perspective. And it is uh, almost regularly used as some kind of the Orthodox model of church-state relations. And of course, as uh, the Orthodox uh, expression of political of orthodox political thinking. And uh, of course, the problem with that is there are a couple of problems. Uh, first problem is that uh, I don't find anything particularly orthodox about it, so that the concept is problematic from a theological perspective, that that is something that cannot really be defended uh, from a theological perspective. 
The second problem is, of course, terminology in itself that's used, which uh, reflects a lot of historical and ideological baggage that was imported in the concept from the very beginning and, of course, continued to be used in a variety of uh, biased ways. Of course, it doesn't mean that there is a non-biased approach to this, but biased in, a, in an unconscious way. Uh, to start with, uh, we have the concept of Byzantine Empire, which I also in the book really criticize. Of course, there is nothing new about it. Uh, proposing that we should really try, you know, give our best to try to move away from using that concept uh, in, in, in scholarship. And for obvious reasons, uh, the state called the Byzantine Empire never existed. Uh, people who inhabited that state called themselves Romans. And that state was called in various ways uh, during its long history, uh, uh, Romania, you know, you could say Romania, or just uh, meant uh, the state of, of the Romans. Roman state, Roman empire, uh, the scholarship describes it, of course, I think with, uh, uh, with reason as Eastern Roman empire, because there was the Western one. But in any case, uh, some variations of that name that preserves its link with Roman Empire, classical Roman Empire, is what I think is, is, is needed. Why? It's not just an abstract terminological problem. Uh, uh, the, uh, the reasons why I think it is very useful to use even later in history, the concept of Roman Empire, is that it reflects the way for most of the time up to the very late period, uh, how the inhabitants of that empire, how the administrative apparatus, but also up to a point, the whole ideology perceived themselves in connection uh, with Rome. So there is no disconnect, unlike in the case of the Western Empire, there is no disconnect in the East between classical empire and uh, later, let's say, Christian or Christianized empire. There is rather a continuity, there is a change, that is for sure, but there are changes also within ancient Roman Empire, and we still call it Roman Empire, we don't use uh, different terms to label different periods in its history, and they were uh, really very different when you look closely into individual, individual parts. So that's the first problem with Byzantine. And the second, of course, with Symphonia, because Symphonia is not only just a theologically dubious concept, but it is also dubious from a historical perspective because the concept is supposed to reflect uh, a kind of harmony between church and state and also ideologically between theology and let's use modern day terms, political ideology or, or state propaganda. But the problem is that, of course, they were on both sides, both within the church and uh, in the state uh, system, uh, people who were trying to kind of harmonize these things or present them as part of one unified whole. But for most of the time, actually, we can see uh, from histories that were there that that uh, aspiration, of course, they never used the concept of of Byzantine or symphony for that matter to describe these relationships. But there was of course that idea in the, in the background when you read what they were trying to say, that is more or less uh, uh, how they understood uh, the ideal, uh, ideal relations between state and the church. But for most of the time, that was an ideal, that was at the level of propaganda and aspiration, uh, what they were you know, trying to articulate, but not really realities. Uh, for many reasons, and one of them being a kind of struggle and tension between church and state. Uh, the aspiration of the state to control, whenever possible, uh, the church and use the church for its own purposes, integrate the church uh, within the state, but also then the aspiration of church leaders and also other parts of the church uh, to counterfeit and sometimes either just to uh, ask for certain level of autonomy and then say, look, uh, you emperors, you have your own realm that you should attend to and church is something else. So leave us our uh, space to 
freely operate, or even later on when the empire was much weaker and emperors, individuals, and individual emperors were weak, there were aspirations uh, of patriarchs to actually impose models that we know much more from the West, from uh, papacy, when, when Roman popes tried to uh, do exactly that, to affirm their power above uh, the power of political leaders and states. So we see here, uh, taking these things into account, that Byzantine symphony is a highly problematic concept that most of the time really doesn't, doesn't, doesn't describe anything apart from a vague idea of some kind of harmony between church and state, between church and state ideologies, theologies, political philosophies, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and in doing that, there is also nothing really, it, it's not one model uh, for the entire history of the Eastern Empire. Uh, as I just mentioned, there are actually many models that are normally just ignored uh, when we use the concept of symphony. Uh, actually, when you unpack, and, and I try to do that in the first part of the book, uh, looking at, at individual periods, you, you find there a, a range of uh, ideas what these relationships uh, are supposed to look like. From the idea that church should be part of the state, from the idea that the state should be under the church, the ideas that these are two more or less autonomous realms that cooperate uh, uh, in a kind of harmonious ways to those who would actually propose some kind of a tension. So autonomy without that much of an integration, like uh, making one unified whole, but rather uh, keeping their spheres of influence separate and not meddling into each other, uh, other's business. Uh, which, of course, makes it this, this, the use of this concept even more problematic and even more uh, uh, complex. And, and finally, uh, if you understand symphony or symphonia as uh, uh, an aspiration to reach a harmony between church-state relations, you can, you can virtually uh, label all models of church-state relations, some kind of a symphony, unless the state is openly anti-church or anti-Christian, such as in the case of classical, certain periods of classical Roman Empire, or let's say the Soviet Union, and uh, that kind of Bolshevik approach to, to Christianity, to Orthodox Christianity and the church. Everything that is not that extreme in the history of the West and virtually all of the models that historically developed in the West could be labeled in this way, in, in, uh, you know, with such a vague definition as some kind of symphonic models, uh, whether it be in the Catholic countries, predominantly Catholic countries, or even more so uh, Protestant countries. Uh, and this also teaches us an important lesson that actually there is nothing really, I think, unique about the predominant mainstream political theologies in Orthodox Christianity. Uh, what, what we find there uh, as a main idea is what we find elsewhere as well. Uh, to make things even more puzzling and even more paradoxical over the history of modernity, actually Orthodox Church started adopting and imitating primarily Protestant models. Uh, and, uh, and the great example there is Peter the Great, who actually uh, imitated uh, clearly and tried to impose Protestant models, primarily Swedish model of church-state relations, where the church is subordinated to the state and it is supposed to, of course, contribute to the stability of the state, to uh, state ideology, stability of the ruling dynasty, and so on and so forth. Mama, fam, vero? È vero. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, and, and the reason just, and to, uh, I'll, I'll finish with this kind of historical part, uh, the reason why uh, keeping in mind these, let's call them namely real histories that were what was going on there in the early periods of the Eastern Empire helps us see something that uh, I think is extremely important and is normally overlooked in theological narratives 
about church-state relations, that actually what evolved uh, in the Eastern Empire was just a continuation of the classical understanding of religion, state, relation within the ancient Roman, Roman Empire. As you may know, ancient Romans didn't really have a kind of distinction that modern we have, like modern Westerners, a distinction between religion and state uh, or secular and religious sphere uh, in, a, in a very clear way. Uh, the state was something that embraced religion and pontifical Roman colleges, uh, colleges of priests, various types of priests, were actually functions more or less as state officials and Roman religion, its primary purpose was to actually bring the stability, continuation, expansion, and uh, contribute to the well-being of the state of the Romans. Uh, that mindset continued even when the Roman state embraced Christianity. And this is, I think, the beginning of that tension between Christianity that really doesn't work the same way as ancient Roman religion, trying to fit it within the already existing uh, uh, institutional, but also ideological structures of the ancient Roman Empire. And Constantine the Great, what people uh, keep forgetting when they call him uh, you know, equal to the apostles or you know, a saint and so on, a great Christian uh, ruler, uh, well, he actually was still uh, Pontifex Maximus. He still uh, played part within the Roman state that included uh, the mindset of the ancient Roman religious slash political ideas, uh, not those, uh, those Christian ideas. And the main problem there that would continue to be a problem throughout the history of the Roman state and then also well into modernity up to modern states, up to basically you know, Putin nowadays uh, is the, in my view, the incompatibility between uh, the needs of individual states and state ideologies and Christianity. Uh, in particular, of course, my approach is, is Orthodox Christian approach. And this incompatibility stems from uh, the impossibility of being at the same time a loyal citizen of earthly kingdoms and a loyal citizen of the kingdom of God. That this loyalty really cannot be uh, merged. Uh, if you want to be Christian, if you want to uh, embrace fundamentally what Christianity is about, then you cannot really be ultimately loyal to uh, earthly kingdoms. And earthly kingdoms belong to what in the New Testament terminology is called this world. And this world is contrasted to the kingdom of God. Now, this world should also not be understood as a, a kind of division between material and spiritual, because also these terms are modern terms that didn't work the same way when used in a, in a pre-modern context. Uh, and this world definitely, this phrase, was not meant to describe something that would be material versus spiritual, but rather can be interpreted, I think, in a, in a much a more theologically more appropriate way, as the sphere of necessity, as a certain logic, not that much things, not phenomena, but certain logic of existence that contradicts the logic of the kingdom of God. And that ultimately, if you especially follow uh, Nikolai Berdyaev and also partly uh, John Zuzulas, that ultimately becomes the question of uh, freedom, necessity, duality. So not matter, spirit, not really uh, anything else, but uh, freedom, necessity. And there is this stream uh, in the history of uh, religious thought and Orthodox theology that really uh, sees this as the basic conflict and sees political structures being built on necessity, of necessity as a particular logic 
of existence that's built into how we, who we are, how we exist in this world. And to just give you an illustration of that, uh, we can actually see it at the level of biology, the idea that we, we are brought into this world without nobody asked us, nobody could have asked us whether we want to uh, exist or not and how. And uh, our very being is defined in so many ways uh, that poses real challenge to our freedom. Then uh, on top of that, you have uh, interhuman relationships that of course further complicate things. And then you have an attempt to organize human societies or establish states that even further increase the level of necessity and pose uh, all that poses a real challenge to, to our freedom. Uh, contrary to that, the logic that we could uh, describe as the logic of the kingdom of God uh, is the logic of freedom and love. In other words, it is the idea that uh, the existence in the eschatological kingdom of God, the stuff of that existence, if you will, uh, is made or will be made, time categories apply there a little differently, uh, will be made out of freedom and love. And in such a uh, context, in this eschatological kingdom of God, there won't be uh, any room or need for oppression of any kind. But that idea, so this duality between necessity and, uh, and freedom can never be fully resolved uh, during the course of history. Uh, in history, we always deal with uh, imperfections. And the choice there is not really between some kind of absolute freedom uh, or absolute necessity, but it is about choosing uh, which logic should be affirmed. Uh, what is, do we want to affirm a logic that actually turns our existence more toward that kind of, of a future existence that we have in mind when we say the kingdom of God, or will it be based and affirm more the logic that belongs to this world, the world of necessity? And an important consequence of that is that if we approach things that way, why anarchism in the, in the theological sense can never be identified with, uh, with one single well-shaped political model or philosophy is precisely that it sees in all possible political models and all possible ways of organizing society a problem. Uh, because it is not just a problem of how we interact with others, how either other individual human beings or institutions oppress us, but also the, re re the uh, realization uh, that we are, own, we are oppressed by our own being. So we we are in need of the transformation of our own being, not just of transformation of, of uh, interpersonal relationships or, or something else. Uh, the way we exist is a challenge to our freedom. And this is what uh, in the Orthodox tradition is meant by the concept of theosis, the need to, for deification. Uh, that means as some Orthodox theologians uh, put it, uh, not only to, uh, to exist without an end, but also to exist without a beginning. And if you just uh, use uh, Greek words here, that really means becoming an anarchist, anarchos, the one without the beginning, without the, this uh, initial cause that is uh, not the product of our freedom. So in a very fundamental sense, I would say, uh, Christians are called to be anarchists. And in a very fundamental sense, um, the kingdom of God is anarchy. And that really is the exact phrase that Nikola Berejaev used. Uh, the kingdom of God is anarchy because it is the realm that is based on freedom and freedom and love, which can never really be, or at least I cannot see how it can be, uh, the primary stuff or the salt stuff out of which we can build our societies. 
And this is the difference between an anarchist who is a theologian and an anarchist who just embraces anarchism as a political philosophy. Uh, the, the anarchist as a, a political thinker or an activist, uh, he or she can afford to fight for one model that they believe uh, would be ideal, trying to shape societies, believing that there is a way to organize society in, a, uh, in the best possible way, which would be in accordance with human nature, as some anarchists historically have tried. Uh, and the theologian, anarchist, who uh, realizes that that is an impossibility, that we will always be oppressed both by our own being and by many other things, but what we can do is to affirm another theological concept, uh, the uh, image of God or the icon of God in the human being, which is precisely this ability uh, to uh, exercise our freedom, creativity, and ultimately love, which starts the transformation of our existence already here and now, and also allows us to, up to a point, uh, transform our social and political realities in order to render them uh, more humane uh, and also more useful. So I think this, this was uh, an overview that gives you an insight, uh, at least partly, into the main line of argument and main ideas that are presented in the book. It's already 1236. So I think it would be good uh, to stop here and then open up for your questions, comments, uh, ideas. I'm really interested in what you have to say now. Thank you, Davor. That was great. Um, so we've got plenty of time for questions. People can use this um, raising your hand function. Um, who wants to go? Gabriel. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, Dabur. Uh, thanks for your, um, thank you for this. And uh, I was, uh, first let me say that I was so impressed with the title of your book because it's so provocative and I just love uh, <laughs> this kind of, um, yeah, I always love this kind of uh, titles and yeah, like, uh, as you say, so, so such unnatural uh, uh, relations, you know. Um, now I'm uh, I'm doubly interested in in, in this topic because um, even though I'm I'm not uh, I, I, I'm not uh, I don't study this, but I'm uh, uh, at the personal level. Of course, I, I'm I come from Romania, so I'm an Orthodox um, on, on the paper. Okay, officially not, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, and of course um, the idea of anarchism that, as you say, uh, it's very how can I say it is. Um, as you as you present it as uh, not um, not necessarily as a system, but uh, or as a prescriptive model, but as an idea of, of an instrument of critique. Let's say so. Of course, I'm I'm and I I think that it's very easy to be drawn to towards this uh, uh, this this idea. Now, my I, I'm I'm just um, um, I I didn't have the time to uh, to um, I managed to to read your book. Uh, I just browsed it a bit, so um, I, I was just curious. A very, very uh, simple uh, question. Um, I noticed uh, that um, in your, I think, is the title of your intro introduction. Um, it's um, the Orthodox. Uh, how is it? Um, Anarchism and Orthodox Christianity, right? Um, I, I noticed that you put Orthodox um, between you bracketed Orthodox. Um, and I'm, I was just, uh, just curious if this, uh, so if this can be applied, if what you're saying can be applied to, uh, you know, to more generally to, um, to Christian, uh, to, to, uh, other forms of Christianity. I mean, this is why, this is the reason why you bracketed Orthodox or, um, there's something, let's say like, uh, more specific, uh, so. Uh, 
just uh, yeah, just uh, just this. Thank you, thank you very much for this. Oh, thank you, thank you for for the question. I actually didn't bracket orthodox, so it says it's just there, 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 it's just uh, orthodox political theology in the subtitle, and I think also the title of the talk was announced as uh, entering the kingdom of God. So I I, I put uh, uh, anarchism uh, in quotation marks when I use it as uh, political theology. As I said, uh, uh, the primary reason being to make it uh, even a clear distinction between anarchism as a political philosophy and the way I use it, because I sometimes use it just as a political uh, philosophy. I, I hear uh, an echo. I don't know if, if that's just me or if there are some mics that are not turned off. So please check. Uh, it would simplify to just have, have uh, those who talk. Uh, with their mics on. Uh, so, uh, and I do think that uh, this approach is something that can be applied and is actually up to a point applied in uh, other, let's say, denominations or from other theological perspectives. But to make even a you know, bigger point, I really don't uh, identify Orthodoxy or even Orthodox Church with its institutional appearance. I don't think it's completely disconnected, but it's certainly not one and the same thing. Uh, and, and there is for that a lot of uh, uh, foundations in the history of, of orthodoxy and in the orthodox tradition, because you can't really, from an orthodox perspective, uh, define what church is. You know, there is no one definition of, of the church. Church means um, communion of you know, some, something coming together. So in that sense, uh, even God from an Orthodox or Christian perspective exists as a church, you know, a communion of three, three divine persons. Uh, church is communion between the world and, and, and God. Uh, church is, uh, you know, Christ exists as a church in the sense of uh, bringing together uh, human and divine nature, then there is, of course, the, uh, the liturgy as uh, par excellence, the manifestation of the church. So I prefer to look at it as rather concentric circles, not, not a clear cut division between what belongs to the church and what doesn't belong to the church. And I think uh, those approaches are also not something that can be uh, placed or circumscribed within one single uh, denomination or one institution. And I use also for the purposes of my book, also uh, some other theologians uh, who have different backgrounds, because I think there is a correspondence there. And to a large extent, uh, all traditions can benefit from an encounter with other traditions and exchange of ideas, both theological ideas and political ideas. Is, is that enough? Or yes, thank you. I must have, it's my bad then because I must have had um, a, 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 an earlier or a different uh, version. But yeah, the, the question still, I mean, it was the same. I, I, I was just curious to see how, how this could be applied uh, more generally. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks again. Emilia, you have a question. Yes. Um, Thank you, thank you very much, Davor. And first of all, I wanted to apologize. I'm sorry, I'm the one who accidentally your microphone. Um, please accept my apologies. Um, I do have a question um, because uh, it's maybe a background question, it's a theoretical question. Because uh, you uh, you talk uh, or um, you express your position on political theology starting from an historical perspective, which means basically using a, a linear time frame. Uh, what I wanted to ask you if, is, uh, do you um, work on the uh, um, concept of temporality? Because uh, when, it, when, it, when we talk about political theology, um, lots of common words that we use in order to express temporality changes their meaning. Uh, I, I said so uh, because uh, in the very per, uh, last part of your of your talk, you said that uh, what uh, linked anarchism with the kingdom of, 
of God was the, the end and the beginning. So the absence of an end and the absence of a beginning. So I wanted to ask you if you could clarify a little bit uh, the, uh, the temporality you are uh, walking into when, when you talk about uh, theoretical uh, political theology, because sometimes it looks like uh, politics and theology can have a very different, uh, very different content so concepts when it comes to uh, temporality. Uh, thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. That's an important question, and and I'll just try to outline it. It's uh, a part of that is explored in the book, like in the second part of the book. But there is another book where I explored it uh, more in in detail. Uh, this, uh, I think it was published in 2014, The Human Work of Art, where I really try to make a more elaborate point about this approach to the concept of time and why most of the problems that we have um, within uh, kind of trying to articulate Christian approach to many different things. So I, in that book, that was primarily the question of creativity, but it's very relevant also uh, for for this uh, discussion because it goes back to freedom and uh, and this necessity freedom uh, tension uh, that it has to do with uh, with uh, with how we understand time uh, and uh, uh, I, I can just say it's it's a it's a bigger discussion that it seems to me that a serious Christian perspective uh, needs to take uh, this eschatological perspective as normative not historical. Because historical uh, is something that is conditionally real. Uh, and it is different from many philosophies, even idealistic philosophies, insofar as it in a dynamic way relates what from the point of view of our existence in history, this temporality here is not real. But from the point of view of what is normative, for Christians, and that is the kingdom of God, only that what is not real is actually real. And this uh, gap between what is already, but then in the future from our perspective now, is a way to both give uh, this uh, real quality, real substance, real stuff to what exists in this world, but it also allows for freedom. So it allows for, for this gap and this, uh, uh, this leap, which allows us to move from the created and the deterministic into the uncreated and free. But to explore that, it's a um, broader complicated, uh, think so to explore it because it has to do with another fundamental concept in orthodox theology actually the fundamental concept i think and that's iconicity how we can actually through an icon we can bring together two things that are different without reducing them to either one or the other but also without making a clear-cut distinction and and this iconic mode of existence actually i think allows us to bridge this gap, but without reducing either this reality to the one that will be or the one that will be to the one that is here. So I, I'm afraid that that a, a more detailed explanation would uh, take uh, at least the rest of our time that we have. So probably it's better to just stop here. Thank you. If, you. if that was useful, if you or or, or did you meet something? Uh, mean yes. Something? Yes. So just wanted to, to know if you think that the concept of capital uh, can be useful when, when we talk about uh, political theology, because it's one of the most interesting evolution of uh, philosophy. Uh, sorry, I, I missed the last part. The connection wasn't. Yes, because it's one of the most interesting uh, evolution in Carl uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a uh, there there uh, you know there are many uh, uh, things there to to be unpacked and uh, uh, to be addressed properly. Uh, what seems to me is from from this perspective that uh, anarchism is a way to actually uh, use something that 
is already there available in the vocabulary of political philosophy and just the history of political thought uh, and, and use it in a meaningful way. So it's not just inventing things that are just totally unrelated to some of these real histories, but then to use it in such a way which would uh, clearly point to uh, those aspects that are from that perspective problematic when it comes to the organization of our societies and this power dynamic that exists, always exists there, if we want to address, do something about it, but also to point to the tension uh, between a theological approach and an approach that is just focused on political realm without any interest really for, for those who are not Christians, you know, eschatology is just useless concept so it's not unless uh, you know it, it plays some kind of a role as a concept in, in creating real real uh, uh, policies but otherwise that's not an interesting thing so it would be useless to try to impose that as something that needs to be there but I do think that uh, our core political problems that have to uh, to do with power dynamic that they stem from our existential problems and that without actually trying to articulate them in this existential realm, we can actually barely grasp uh, the implications and the meaning of these problems in uh, what we label simply a socio-political realm. But then it turns out always the socio-political realm is some kind of at least secular religious realm rather than something purely secular, whatever that would mean. Thank you. Okay, I think next we have a question from Vasilis. Uh, yes, I'm trying to see how I can show myself. Uh, okay. Can you see me now? Yeah. Uh, barely. Okay. <laughs> better than so thank you. Th <laughs> it's going to become better, I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thanks, Davor, for a fascinating speech. It's actually great to get the chance to hear what orthodox political theology is about, because I think Western audiences are not very trained. Uh, they don't know very well what it means and what it stands for. I, I recently participated in a forum on uh, Miguel Fatter's fascinating two volume project, Divine Democracy and, the Li and Living Law. And um, I had actually, in order to speak about Christian Trinitarianism, I had to use Eric Peterson as a vehicle because obviously uh, Western audiences are not very familiar with Zizulas or Losky or Yanaras or all these great Orthodox theologians, uh, Greek or Russians. Uh, so thanks very much for, for this. And I, I wanna start from, from, from what I mentioned earlier that I've, uh, you know, that book by Miguel Fater, Living Law. Uh, it's a very interesting book uh, and it relates to the way you understand the concept of anarchy. That's why I'm mentioning it. I don't know whether you're familiar with this book by Miguel Fater. And he's engaging there with a tradition that he calls theocratic anarchic rule in Jewish political theology. And he starts with Philo. Philo is the hero of this book. Philo is obviously the hero for the Greek fathers, Greek Orthodox fathers as well. Philo is the person who affected the Jewish Greek synthesis, basically. And that led later on to the theology of the Cappadocian fathers and so on. And of course, we know that after the Ressourcement movement, all this, the Catholic Ressourcement theologians who revived the Greek fathers uh, in the 20th century and reminded us the, the connections and the links between Philo or the Philonian tradition and Greek Orthodox theology. Why am I mentioning all this? Because in that book, Father is trying to say something about what anarchy is in this theocratic context. Basically, anarchy is theocracy, because I was listening to you and you gave me the impression when you were developing it, that what you have in mind when you talk about anarchy is this idea of libertarianism. It sounded to me too libertarian, but in the theological tradition, anarchy is theocracy. It's the rule of God, uh, because it's the rule of freedom. It's, it's salvation and freedom. Uh, God stands, the rule of God stands in judgment of all the powers and principalities of this world. That's why it, st it stands for, for freedom. And of course, the, the word itself means no rule. Uh, so this, this is the tradition that uh, Fater also uh, uh, sort of identifies in this book. 
he doesn't make the step to connect it with Christian Trinitarianism, to connect it with Christian political theology, and especially with Orthodox political theology, what you're doing in your work. But I think this is the link missing there in that book. But the tradition is the same. Is this anarchic, theocratic, Jewish and Christian, in my view, uh, political theology that represents something else, a different way of living. Uh, the, the other thing that struck me in, the, in your presentation, when you talked about these, uh, this idea of uh, what, what this world stands in orthodox political theology and, and theology in general, uh, and, and you made this distinction between necessity and freedom. In my view, this distinction is more philosophical than theological. I understand why you, you make this distinction. Uh, and this is, I think, a criticism that the theologies of Zizioulas and Yanaras, all these person-oriented theologies have received for making a distinction between nature equated with necessity on the one hand and person equated with freedom on the one hand. And in some ways, denigrating the idea of creation because we are, you know, creation, uh, let's put it differently, a more theological distinction instead of uh, freedom versus necessity would be uh, a sin sinful world versus a saved world. So salvation versus perdition rather than freedom versus necessity because necessity implies or some might uh, actually claim that it is a Gnosticizing tendency in orth Orthodox theology because you equate creation with necessity. Uh, whereas the Pauline tradition, I think, uh, has more to do with the fact that this world is the world of sin, not of necessity necessarily, a world of sin, uh, a world of per perdition, a world where, a world where uh, the principalities of this world uh, rule through the use of violence and so on, versus uh, the, the, the kingdom of God, which is the message of salvation and the message of freedom in that sense. So, I mean, that's my only, if you have something to say about that, I know that your, your sources is, is Yulas and Yanaras, and they have been criticized for doing that. So I wonder whether you differentiate yourself from that or you go along with that idea of necessity versus freedom uh, as, you know, being relevant on the theological register as well. Mm. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, very important and interesting and complicated question. Uh, so a couple of things to, to, to be said. Um, there is something in the way, for example, Zizulas uh, approaches these uh, existential issues that corresponds uh, pretty closely to Berjaev. So it corresponds, so there is, it's not always expressed in same terms, but uh, basic ideas are there. So, uh, both for Zizulas and Berenjaev, there is something that is uh, something, uh, you know, problematic about the way we exist in history. And it has to do with uh, this, uh, Berenjaev would sometimes use a person, sometimes individual, not, not really consistently. Uh, Zizulas try to make, clarify the distinction between the individual and person or personhood. Uh, and, and the reason why I, uh, if you take this pretty abstract conceptual differentiation, and then you try to apply it on, uh, let's say, uh, naively a real world situation. So in, in you know, context where we live, and especially in liturgical context, there is a danger that you might be labeled as, you know, really stepping out of not only Orthodox, but Christian tradition, because it seems almost like making a kind of dualism that can easily end up in this um, material versus spiritual, in some kind of Neoplatonism or whatever else. Uh, but if you think of that as two different logics, and if you think of, to go back to your point about uh, Paul and, and the idea of uh, sin as being characteristic, uh, you know, the, the, that problem that we have with our existence here, you can ask a simple question now, but what is sin, you know, from a, from a, from Northwest perspective? And what you go, is... You go, you go to Romans for that. 
Yeah, yeah, but we, sure, but like you need to go to to everything else that you that you find there, and Paul in particular, or Paul line, uh, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this discussion, like the authorship of of those epistles. But you you find uh, the idea in the Christian tradition that uh, the sin is our inability or our uh, missing the existential target. So there is, there is uh, the orientation that we are moving and it's kind of historical also process, but we also individually participate in it, uh, which moves toward the kingdom of God. And of course, if you go to Maximus, then you, you have the idea that it is somehow built into uh, the created world, that there is this tendency to actually go to uh, this realm of the communion with God, which gives uh, life and all of that. Uh, now, sin means just missing that existential target. But the problem is that the way we exist is existence by necessity. So the logic of our existence, if you put it that way, if you think it of that way, is sinful. If I agree, it, I agree. I, I just said that this distinction between freedom and necessity is more philosophical. What the theological distinction between sinfulness and salvation saves is the possibility that creation was not created deformed. The, the reality, however, that the, the, the creation was not created deformed and that we carry the possibility of, in a sense, restoring that very nature, that nature which is not equated with necessity because it was created by God. So that's what sometimes is Eulas and Lossky and others run the danger of falling into. They run the danger of falling into this distinction between sinfulness as necessity, uh, natural necessity, almost Gnostic-like, versus personhood, which represents the overcoming of our natures, they say. I don't, I'm not really sure that it's, this sounds very orthodox, the overcoming of our nature through personhood. Okay, well, but I don't think that there is actually between what you are saying and, you know, what you label philosophical, that there is that much of a distinction because uh, you you don't need to, uh, well, one option is uh, uh, to, uh, you know, sharpen the contrast and then say, well, it's uh, either or, but in history, it's it's not either or, it's both. And, but there is a tendency and, and it seems, you know, sometimes it's just a terminological Thing. If you if you uh, uh, say that sin is the necessity that kind of uh, keeps us attached uh, or or uh, keeps us affirming the logic of this world, then there is it's it's not that that much of a difference. The key problem, and that is a serious problem, but I don't think there is a kind of an easy way out to just point like, well, some of this is orthodox, some of that is not, without really a careful uh, exploration of these things. The real problem is uh, what do we do within the Christian context with nature, with uh, created uh, created world? Because it's it won't do to just say, well, it exists, and then it somehow will be uh, given uh, eternal existence. And the idea of the concept of uh, resurrection clearly, you know, preserves that, like the materiality and the realness of our historical existence. But on the other hand, you have a very prominent concept of deification. And then if there is deification, you might ask a, you know, a simple question, if everything is in principle fine with our nature, why do we need deification? Why there was a need actually to, to, uh, for Christ to kind of reunite divine and human. So clearly there is something there, uh, so-called built into the system that even without fall, wouldn't actually be just working fine uh, without any problems because we still would have this problem that our existence wouldn't be based on freedom. And there is a very prominent uh, theological idea in the history of orthodoxy that actually what makes uh, the image of God in a human being is precisely this ability to exist like a God, meaning to exist in a free way. So not to have a cause of your existence as a necessity imposed on you. And, and to resolve yeah. this is, uh, yeah. Uh, you can, of course. No, I, 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 get, I get that. I, I get that. And I think modern scholarship in, the, in those matters points, points exactly to Maximus the Confessor very often on these 
on these issues of, of, of deification and how and what happens to our nature when it is deified and why do we need deification and all that. So there are, I think there are orthodox, let's say, interpretations which are trying to grapple with this, with this, with these questions in, in ways that are trying to avoid these Gnosticizing tendencies. Because there is, as you very well said, there is always the danger that our nature is going to be rejected as some kind of uh, rump materiality that needs to be left behind in some ways. But that's not Maximus the Confessor, that's not the Eastern tradition. Uh, no, but Maximus and, the and, Confessor also has a problem of, you know, you can also see him as a, as a late Neoplatonic uh, uh, manifestation uh, with, with his idea of, uh, of logoi, of, of beings. Uh, and and then it also so so it, I, I think there is there there are ways. First of all, I don't don't believe simply that there is like one orthodox tradition. That's and then it's uh, if yeah. there is a realm where that's clear, that's political uh, um, theology. So there are actually multiple approaches, multiple traditions. And then I always say, well, this seems to me to be a meaningful orthodox approach for these and these reasons. But of course, my approach. Uh, for example, it is of course uh, marginal when it comes to you know the mainstream political uh, theologies, and then the question they are like in, in some way they are orthodox simply in the sense that they stem from the orthodox tradition. They are meant primarily for orthodox people who are written by orthodox uh, you know uh, scholars or theologians, uh, but that shows this plurality. And I wouldn't like also to. Uh, you know, claim that there is just one possible approach. I don't find that also uh, very orthodox. Uh, so yeah. there are multiple, this seems to me to be meaningful, but I wouldn't rule out that, you know, other approaches can perfectly well fit uh, within this or some broader framework. Uh, as you say, the important question is the question of nature. And there are, and, and, and how does it relate to this idea of creation and what happens to nature when it's defied and, and it's a this very the... ill-explored, actually, topic yeah. in, in theology, uh, very uh, obscure, because you uh, then run into all sorts of, of, of troubles as soon as you, as you start moving that way, because it becomes, you know, very often you have then contradictory ideas, and it's not clear, for example, why, you know, if we need to become, and there are, of course, uh, church fathers, very prominent theologians who could be labeled in that simplistic way as you know even gnostic uh, who actually talk about this divinization as really becoming becoming something like we become like gods uh, but then again uh, it's uh, this topic goes back to the old testament it's in psalms your gods uh, so and then what does it mean what is a deification process does it mean you know uh, it's it's and, and sometimes it's just the language that we use that creates a misunderstanding or tensions. And I think to up to, to, a, to a great extent that what also happened in the reception of Zizulas, that just uh, he sometimes, uh, when you bring him and put him in a different context, then he probably was also just lazy, you know, doing something more and then exploring these things uh, even more in depth that actually he opened up more room than it was necessary, I think, for criticism that sometimes is okay, but sometimes I think is 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 just not very well grounded. I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Tom. Next. Yes, so first, am I coming through? Yes. yes. Wonderful. So please forgive me for the background noise. If it comes through, I'm sitting on my balcony. So my question is actually rather simple. I'll keep it concise and short. Um, I remember the famous sentence, at least famous and personal for me, is from a professor I've, I've heard teaching on the subject of ecclesiology. I actually have a master in Catholic theology. And he said, Jesus, uh, Jesus teached or preached the kingdom of God and then came the church. I love that quote. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you relate uh, the concept of the kingdom of God? Um, actually, for me, kingdom of God is, has, well, I shouldn't say has nothing to do, but I should say it's primarily, uh, can be primarily explained through epistemology and metaphysics. Uh, and politics is only kind of like a side effect. So in modern terms, it's a state of mind. So I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, Davor, please. 
So, but but again, is, is there like a, you, my thoughts on on what the kingdom, the how kingdom of God is uh, relevant, or how kingdom of God, how, how I see what what exactly I miss the question. So, no, the question is uh, the kingdom of God is a concept. So I introduced the 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 problem for me with, with the joke from a professor who said. Mm -hmm. Jesus preached the kingdom of God, and then came the church, uh, delineating the difference between what we think the kingdom of God is and what it was for the for Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you want to go back root, like originally, right? That's kind of like what all Christians aim to do. Mm -hmm. And then the the question is, from my perspective, the kingdom of God can be understood properly only through epistemology and metaphysics. And political theology and uh, political, if, if you try to interpret the kingdom of God through political theology, you are what you are actually doing. So this is actually just kind of like my stand. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on it, uh, is that what you're actually doing, you're giving an outcome of that state of mind um, to, to put it to the lowest common denominator. Um, I remember the, the, one of my favorite sayings from Irenaeus. Uh, who said a living man or a man fully living is the glory of God, right? So this entire concept, we've been speaking about it for quite long, about deification. So that's kind of like the what it's all about. And then the outcome of that is how you live it in the society and make the changes in the political structure. So I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. And now, excuse, there is some noise uh, coming. Uh from like uh, my side and I know what it is. Uh, so if you hear something like background noise, uh, try to ignore it and then I'll try to do the same. Uh, I don't, uh, well, first of all, uh, this uh, polarization between like the kingdom of God and the church strikes me as, as something problematic because uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, the kingdom of God is manifested in history precisely through what we call the church and what the church primarily as i just tried to say uh, and this actually relates nicely to the previous uh, discussion uh, what it means concretely in the most uh, uh, concrete and and uh, even kind of uh, very tangible sense is the liturgy is coming together and serving the liturgy, which, which is iconizing the kingdom of God in history. So there is, a, uh, and, and in that sense, I would hesitate to say, well, it's a concept. We use concepts to you know, describe it, to say something about it. But from a theological perspective, the kingdom of God is not primarily a concept. It is, it is a reality, a living reality that can partly be experienced already in history and of course the the most significant thing there is love those practices that actually allow us to love and then love becomes this this nature this stuff that 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 our new existence is built upon uh, so that's uh, that's one thing uh, now that's why i think it is uh, important to keep the tension between the kingdom of God and this world and the political sphere as a par excellence manifestation of necessity in history. Uh, because if we are not careful to keep that tension, we easily turn, we de-eschatologize the church, turning it into a kind of um, an institution of this world or which is the other side of the same medal is uh, trying to uh, supply state institutions or purely secular institution with some kind of metaphysical or better said quasi metaphysical uh, attributes. And that obscures that, that kind of de uh, uh our claims to, for kingdom of God and its presence in this world. And of course it empowers structures of this world. Now, having said all of that, it is uh, it kind of goes without saying that the institutional church in its uh, historical journey 
uh, assumes normally all the characteristics that other institutions of this world have. So it becomes very similar to corporations, to states. And as soon as you have some institution, you'll necessarily have uh, all these uh, troubles, uh, you know, corruption and the quest for power and all these things. That's why I think insistence primarily on liturgy without completely, of course, divorcing it from the institutional uh, context in which that happens, because it's, first of all, uh, not possible to do entirely, is a way to kind of be uh, careful about uh, what is that we are doing. And of course, uh, are we asking questions out of our concern for how structures in this world work and how we can improve them, which is a perfectly legitimate question. And I think that what anarchists should be doing, but it's not a theological question. So that's not the primary concern of the church or theology for that matter. It doesn't mean that uh, we should just be completely as theologians uh, ignorant of it or not do anything, but it's not the primary concern. The primary concern is how to acquire new existence. Uh, yes, if I understood correctly, so there is a strong ontological premise or assumption hidden there, uh, which from which it all begins and which states that, if I'm going to interpret it correctly, is that the church manifests the kingdom of God, kind of like from the orthodox stance, right? Did I get that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. There are no more hands up, but does anybody have any further questions? Okay, maybe I'll ask a closing question, and I think it's going to be a very easy one. As Vasily said, we uh, educated in the West have an extremely elementary or totally non-existent, non-existent knowledge of uh, Orthodox Christianity in general, and definitely Orthodox theology. Um, I've certainly read in a few places that, and I think I think I have a very basic understanding of what is uh, what is meant by iconicity, or uh, as you mentioned, and I think I'm, I'm going to betray that in my question. Um, but you say that iconicity is very very important. I've certainly read that much of the theology of Orthodox Christianity is expressed in icons in visual form rather than uh, in this kind of very academic style academic tradition which is definitely present in the protestant world where swathes and swathes of these great dogma works on dogmatics and so on and so on are being published and that's really the body of theology um you say that your approach is quite fringe and i'm curious are there places or are there iconographical representations from which this through which your understanding of uh, of anarchism this type of theological anarchism as the as an authentic interpretation of orthodox Christianity can be seen, because I can certainly think of examples of um, iconographic representations of a very mainstream, very, very state, uh, very closely related to the nation state and the national churches um, in icons, particular. Well, the example, the only example I really know is in the crypts of the St. Sava Cathedral in Belgrade. Um, where there are many examples of, you know, very visual representations of this uh, church, state, nation, nation, uh, church, fitting them together, as you said, making them fit together. Um, and I'm just curious if there are if there are iconographical uh, archives or or sites or examples of work um, which kind of point to this more anarchical interpretation of Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks Davor, for that. Davor, can I interject just for a minute? Uh, because I, I wanted to add something to the previous conversation, if I'm allowed, about the, you know, this famous dictum that, you know, Christ or Jesus Christ uh, came and then church came afterwards. <laughs> um, I think in the Orthodox tradition, but also in the common Christian tradition, the first 10 centuries, I would say, uh, this distinction didn't necessarily exist. This is a very Protestant distinction. You know, the charismatic quality of Jesus teaching on the one hand and the institutional or historical church on the other. This is very, very Protestant. We know 
we know from uh, Anna Rita Lubac, for example, the Corpus Mysticum, that the, the church didn't only carry the charismatic quality that it was conferred uh, to it by, by Jesus Christ, but it was also as an institution, as we can call it today, back then they wouldn't call it an institution, but as a series of practices, perhaps, never separated from, char from charisma, from the charismatic dimension. The charismatic dimension and the, and the dimension of the practices through which this charisma uh, communicates uh, with the world uh, were never separate. Uh, De Lubac characteristically says that this is, this is a development, the separation of the charismatic from the institutional is a development that started in the 11th century in the Latin West, maybe goes back to the 9th century as well. But uh, it's definitely not there. Nancy, by the way, Jean-Luc Nancy calls this understanding of Christianity uh, or, or this, let's, let's call it interpretation of the first four or 500 years of Christianity uh, as some kind of degeneration from the first moment, you know, from the moment Eusebius, for example, institutionalized the Christian religion as the religion of the empire, the, the dominant Protestant interpretation is to call that a form of, of degeneration. He calls it uh, the Rousseauianism of Christianity. <laughs> that means this idea that early Christianity, primitive Christianity is good, and from the moment uh, Eusebius and Constantine institutionalized uh, Christianity as the formal religion of the empire, then all the bad things start happening and the de-eschatologization of the church started and so on. That's a very limited reading. Uh, if we follow uh, the Lubac at least, this de-eschatologization starts in the 11th century or the 12th century. Uh, even, I mean, yeah. again, it's debatable. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I just, I, I have, a, of course, a different reading. I think, yes, the, the idea that there was at the beginning some kind of primordial um, state of uh, paradise of Christianity that got corrupted, you know, later on, or with Christianization, it's just you know, divorced from from reality. Uh, first of all, we we can see that even from New Testament documents, you know, how corrupt. You just read epistles of Paul, you know, and you can deduce of what kind of insanity must have been there in those early churches. So it's like. A, uh, it's a much more, on the one hand, pessimistic reading. So problems have been there uh, from the very beginning, and they continue. It's a different kind of problems in each period. But like, if you if we want to use that language of corruption, yeah, it's there from the very beginning. Um, and you know, partly, uh, you know, Christ complained about it, and then when you know Paul complained about it, and then we have first councils uh, showing the disputes and disagreements and, and all sorts of things. And then on top of that, what also gets obscured is what I tried to do here. One thing that I didn't, didn't mention this at the beginning of this presentation is that I tried, in addition to presenting these mainstream narratives, to outline alternative approaches to political theologies from, let's say, the very beginning. Uh, and very often you have one in the same author who partly in certain places would affirm let's say close uh, our relations between church and state or Christianity and, and political. And then in other places would actually claim something that is much closer to this anarchist story or what I call proto-anarchist political theologies. And you can see that in, in, in Paul, you can see that uh, in uh, uh, these early documents and you can find theologians who are even prior to Constantine who are very eager to make peace with Roman empire for understandable reasons, you know, after a uh, Jewish war, um, that was, it was, you know, not, or during that time, it was not really very popular to be Jewish. So there is a, well, on, on behalf of, of some Christian groups, there is a natural tendency to kind of label themselves as something else compared to those that Rome now is, is openly in, in conflict with, which of course then produced a tendency to actually try to find a compromise and even ideologize and even give an iconic function to the state, Roman state and its empire. Prior to, to Eusebius, uh, Lactantius is the biggest example of those who are trying to harmonize and to present Christian story as, as essentially Roman story, saying, well, look, if just Romans want to go back to their original Romanists, uh, they'll find their Christianity. So there is no actually uh, fundamental distinction between that and that. 
so what I uh, was trying to say is that from the very beginning, we have at least, of course, many shades in between, but roughly speaking, two main tendencies. One that is skeptical toward this harmonizing Christianity, Christian story, church, particular understandings of the church, uh, whether it's more institutional or more liturgical and so on, and the state and state ideology, and the other, and sometimes one in the same author who actually has both in, in their writings, uh, the other that is uh, seek some kind of a harmony between these two, uh, tries to put it together, tries to explain that actually institutions of this world also perform a kind of um, uh, role within the whole history of salvation and so on and so forth. If you read the Revelation of John, uh, you know, it's hard to get more anarchic than that if you see that empire as actually personification of political structures in general. Then you go back to Paul. Some places, yeah, he asks, you know, pray for authorities, pray for this. But then other places are much more radical that actually from, from which you can derive this tension, metaphysical tension, tension between uh, this world and and the kingdom of God. And what becomes even more interesting is if you put this uh, together with earlier history, uh, so history of ancient Judaism, where then you can't find anything remotely resembling a coherent position uh, on this. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, we all remember how monarchy was installed uh, in ancient Judaism goes back to your uh, what you mentioned, uh, uh, anarchy theocracy, so that there is a theocratic concept, but, the, but theocratic in, in a direct sense, God is the leader, but like no leaders, no firm structures uh, in this world. And when people asked, you know, give us the king, uh, God's uh, explanation and says, yes, give them the king, they abandoned me. So now they want to be as, as the rest of people in this world. That means they left me. I'm not their God any longer. So give them the king. Um, it's a sign. And if you link that with what I think is extremely interesting exploration of Margaret Barker and the first temple tradition, then all of this becomes even more interesting because you can link many of those practices and concepts, including now going back to Paul's uh, question about uh, icons and iconicity, you can link it to the symbolism of the first temple and the charisma, as you mentioned, uh, charisma in its original meaning, you know, something that has to do with holy oil that brings wisdom uh, to those who are anointed by, by the holy uh, oil. Uh, and they, in that sense, become the bearers of, of the spirit. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, and there you have the concept of, uh, again, the king, and uh, but, but that king is, and the vision of the king is placed in the Holy of Holies, and the Holy of Holies uh, stands for, especially in the first temple tradition, how uh, Barker reads it, uh, for the kingdom of God. So the entrance, this all that whenever we see like the heaven or seated in the heaven, uh, we should read that as a, a vision from the Holy of Holies uh, and an iconic representation of the kingdom of God so that the high priest exiting uh, the Holy of Holies, moving into the holy place, becomes actually the icon of Christ uh, who comes there and actually takes the body through going through the carton. Of, of the temple. And that kind of narrative or symbolism is then repeated, you can read it that way in the, in the, in the New Testament, which kind of keeps this distinction and you can read it either more political or you can focus on more, let's say, uh, existential things and read it as something that is a cosmic drama that actually always has preserves this tension between political structures or necessity or uh, the exercise of power as a par excellence uh, manifestation of necessity in this world and eschatological kingdom, which is about freedom and, and, and love. Now, just to final, I think time is slowly uh, uh, running out. So I'll just uh, briefly address uh, Paul's uh, question. Uh, there are two ways to, to, to answer your question about icons and iconicity. One is just uh, focusing on iconography as you did uh, and, and you're perfectly correct that a lot of uh, images, paintings in the history of Christianity, and here again, there is nothing specifically orthodox, it's kind of the same uh, everywhere, wherever you look, trying to depict the proximity between Christ and earthly rulers, between saints and political leaders and so on and so forth. 
uh, and you have a lot of uh, uh, paintings uh, depicting that. But then you also have paintings uh, depicting both political and church leaders as those who will end up in hell uh, as, a, as a warning. And in particular, since you mentioned St. Sava in Belgrade, also in medieval Serbian monasteries, you can find uh, those images that are, and we know, or we can say with high level of certainty that they were commissioned by uh, high church representatives to actually depict bishops uh, uh, and, and, and political leaders uh, as uh, those who will end up in, in hell uh, as a kind of sending uh, message that uh, this institutional function or institutional uh, functioning within these church and state institutions does not automatically uh, lead you uh, anywhere. Uh, another uh, approach to that you can see in, uh, of course, it would be too much to call that uh, anarchic, but there is a there is a logic to give up before you are uh, too old or before you die to give up on being the ruler and become a simple monk. So that's another thing which is also then depicted in iconography: the idea that uh, that you should, which kind of reflects that there is something that is not quite right there, uh, that you need to commit as a political leader. You are in the realm of sin. Um, and, and then to make up for that, uh, but you willingly sometimes, um, in an ideal case scenario, of course, um, in, in real life, it's mostly power, hunger, and all of that. But, uh, but conceptually speaking, you're there assuming upon yourself this uh, burden of serving as a political leader, knowing that it's something bad, that something is not, that's not really something, but like needs, somebody needs to do it. So it's a kind of almost self-sacrifice. And then in order to compensate for that, uh, you give up on that at some point of time and you become a simple monk. You go and become a monk just as everybody else uh, trying to reach uh, the salvation. Another example of uh, images that promote something that really comes very close to, to uh, anarchism, even in practical terms, are the icons of holy fools. And holy foolishness as a very prominent phenomenon, primarily in the Russian tradition, which, uh, of course, uh, holy fools are not exclusive to the Orthodox tradition, but one would claim that they play the most significant role uh, within the Orthodox tradition, especially in the early modern period um, in Russia, where, I mean, it's just like, yeah, I, I want to take more of your time explaining the, the phenomenon, but it is interesting from many perspectives, and they were practicing all sorts of in, insanities, uh, insulting both church leaders, political leaders, uh, trying to denounce them, uh, interrupting church services, uh, all sorts of things, uh, and being normally beaten up or killed even, uh, and then celebrated pretty much in a mirroring uh, the ideal of Old Testament prophets as those who somehow are in a direct connection with God, and who promote this other logic, the other mode of existence, if you will, that challenges and clashes with everything that is the order of this world, with everything that is accepted as a social value, morality, uh, state, church structures, or routines, uh, everything that is good from the perspective of this world, they would challenge that. And then, of course, be depicted as saints uh, in the Orthodox iconography. But uh, more to the point, when I use the concept of iconicity, it has to do with the images are just one part of that icons as as paintings or as as kind of mostly two dimensional it can be three dimensional objects but iconicity is much more than that iconicity is really a concept that allows for what is not to be present in what is uh, and that is uh, why iconicity allows for freedom it opens up many other issues and problems, but maybe we can leave that for some other time. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation and thank you everyone for the great questions. We're slightly over time, so I think we should wrap it up. See you all next week. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, thank you, you very well. much for a great talk. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Bye.